Good morning, everybody. Uh, Fergus Dolan here from NALA. Delighted to have you here this morning for our webinar on raising literacy awareness with people work, working with marginalized communities. Uh, we have two speakers today. Uh, our first speaker is Celine McInerney. And Celine is a local, is a training initiative assistant coordinator, and she's primary healthcare worker with Offaly Traveller Movement. Hi, Celine. Good morning, everybody. And Celine is going to talk to you about education and advocacy and the importance of literacy, numeracy and IT skills in her work with travellers. So over to you, Celine, and all the best. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, I might just start by telling you a little bit about my own personal experience as a traveller when it came to um, education and literacy. So to begin, I suppose I never would have went through the education system because I was um, obviously a traveller, born to traveller from a travelling community. And my parents, my father, who has since passed away at the time, travelled. So we would have travelled from place to place, town to town. And education or going to school wouldn't have been seen as a priority. It wouldn't have been something that was valued within the family or within the community. Um, the only kind of thing I knew younger about education was I was sent to school for a couple of weeks to make my first Holy Communion. And that's when I would have been told about school. You have to go to school to make your Holy Communion. Uh, I would have left after I made my first Holy Communion. My sisters and brothers are very similar to me. I come from a family of six, three boys, three girls. I have an older sister and the second oldest, and the youngest is 32. So of six of my family, my parents never were educated. They're both illiterate. Um, my mother would have went to school but not been educated at the time. Um, only one member of my family went to preschool, primary school and secondary school and done her junior cert. She done a course after that, but she never went any further. She got married and she has three children today. She's uh, she's separated, but she has three young children. So I would have learned about school then to make my Holy Communion, a couple of weeks, make my confirmations, brothers and sisters similar. All my cousins, relatives, family and friends similar to my experience. It wouldn't have been any different, anything out of the way. Yeah. Um. When I got older then, when I turned 18, or sorry, when I was 16 then, there was such a thing, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, or since done away with due to um the recession. In 2012, they all closed in Ireland. They were called traveller training centres. So the government opened up these things called senior traveller training centres to educate a group of people who were uneducated, marginalised, hugely discriminated against and had very low literacy and little or no chance of employment or been employment and we're all mainly on unemployment uh, government benefit so I would have went to that for a year myself and my sister maybe nine months or something I kind of left it because I found it a bit difficult there would have been a lot of maybe people finding it difficult to get on with each other in it and we would have been quite and kept to ourselves so kind of for that reason I would have left it but not got to do with the tutors or any other side of the education system. I've, in there, I learned a bit, bits and pieces. Um, then I would have left that, waited till I was 18, signed on job seekers payment. I was unemployed for a couple of years. And then as I got older, I kind of realized living your day-to-day -day life, going about day-to-day -day life, that being able to read and write and do maths and basic literacy Technology at that time wasn't really important. I didn't really need to use technology. Like today, you can't exist or live without technology. But 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, it wasn't something that was something I needed to know. But I did know, realize that I needed to know how to read and write and spell. I found it difficult going to a supermarket to do shopping for my parent because when I'd be sent in trying to add up the money, I'd buy over the amount and not have enough, or I'd buy under the amount and have some left over. Just applying for a medical card, signing on social welfare, trying to fill in housing application forms to go on the council waiting list. In my family, there was nobody educated. We had nobody around us that was educated. Back in those times, we didn't have the citizens information or awfully organizations like this that give travelers with literacy or NAL or LOE to be 
well, I didn't really know of them. They weren't widely known. They weren't, there was no word out there about them. Like today, they're really advertised and they're known about. Still not everybody knows about them. But we didn't know these supports. They weren't there, I don't think, at the time. So how I would have found out about the LOE TV would have been in my local church. I would have seen a notice, uh, like a flyer, a poster up on the notice board when I go to mass on a Saturday night. And for maybe a couple of weeks, couple of months, could have went on a couple of years, to be honest with you, I would have read this notice and I would have kept saying, oh, Jesus, like, I'd love to do that. I'd love to go and learn how to read and write. But I felt so ashamed and so embarrassed, you know, and to get the self, to build, to have the self-confidence, have the confidence and the self-esteem to actually pick up the phone and ring about it or to call into the center and meet with somebody over it. You know, it took me a long, long time to get up that confidence and that self-esteem. And then one day then, as life went on and dealing with day-to-day -day life and living, I just realized that I was going to have a really, really difficult life if I didn't get some sort of literacy or some sort of basics of reading and writing and spelling. So one day I was um, meeting with like a case officer person for social welfare, trying to put you into courses and help you find jobs. And I told him that it would be very difficult for me to go on a course or find a job because I had no literacy. I never was in the education system. And he said, then, why don't you go over and meet with the LOE TV? So he rang a lady at the time called Mary Midlachlan. She was the head of the LOE TV here in Tullamore. I went and met with her. I found her to be very nice, very friendly, genuine. I felt really comfortable in the meeting with her. So she set me up in a class, a group class, where I would go at nighttime, maybe one day a week from half six to half, half eight or something like that for two hours. Uh, when I went to the, the first group class, I, I found it very, I was very nervous. I was very anxious. Um, when I went in, I found it a little bit difficult. In the beginning, it was a mixed group of mixed ages, you know, and there was men in the group. And I felt a bit uncomfortable because there was men in the group. So I kind of went that night and I, I left the group that night saying to myself, I'll never go back in there again. I won't ever be going back in there again. So I went home with the intention in my head that that was it. I was never going back again. I'd done it and that was the end of it. But again, I couldn't get through life. I found life too difficult, not been able to read and write or been educated. So I said, I may go back. You know, I may go back to this class. I went back as the weeks and months and years went by. I built my confidence, built my self-esteem, built I then kind of realized that all the fears I had and why I put it off for so long, you know, the people in the group and in the class, even though they were non-travelers, some of them were settled people at the time, they could have been non-nationals, refugees maybe as well. They were all there for the same reason, because they needed to get education and get the basics of literacy. So there was none of us any different or any better, or any worse off. We were all there for the one aim and the one goal to learn how to read and write, to make our lives easier and better. And for the people that we were around as well, our family and our community to be able to help and support them as well. So I kind of fell in and fell out due to life and everything else and family problems and issues through the LOE to be system. I would have done it reading, writing, maths, night classes, morning classes, afternoon classes. Then I would have applied for a job here 15, 16 years ago as a youth worker, Went on to do um, a level four or five in um, community development. I got a job then as a primary healthcare worker. I done a diploma last year, a level six diploma in community development and practice. And I now work full time as an LTI assistant coordinator and as a primary healthcare worker. So I feel I've had a long journey to go forward. I had to go kind of go backwards. I had to go back. I still feel today I still have a long way to go where literacy and stuff is concerned. But I keep like I keep linked in with the LOE TV to this day. I'm I was aware of NALA when I also was looking for support around literacy. I also was made aware that there was an organization called NALA and I would have called them up and spoke to them over the phone and got information from them as well. So I found it great that these supports and services were out there for people like me and of my generation that came from a traveling background where at that time education wasn't seen to be something that you did. You didn't send your children to school. We were a nomadic people, a nomadic way of life. And we didn't stay in one place long enough for to go to school long enough and be educated. 
So that's kind of a, a brief thing about my story, how I got from where I began to where I am today. And then I think I'll kind of talk to you now a little bit about where education stands for travellers today in 2023. So kind of education for travellers today, it's, it's a little bit similar to maybe my generation. The only thing been different is there was a trespass law brought out that prevented Irish travellers from moving from place to place in 1995, I think. And it stopped travellers. Tra some travellers still do it. But the majority of travellers settled at that time when this law was brought out, they settled in halting sites um, ran by local councils, unofficial camps, unofficial halting sites. And some of them went into local authority housing. From this, then, travellers were in a position to send children to school. They were then in a place where they didn't travel anymore. They had a postal address. They could register their children for school and children went to school. And most children got educated this way. Most travellers then got a, like your preschool wasn't really that popular then. It's more, more popular now and people are more, travellers are more aware of preschool now. And they're very aware of the importance of sending a child to preschool because it, it prepares them for primary school and so on, secondary, and if they ever decide to go on to third level. So there's a good bit of awareness around preschool now. In my time, preschool was something that wasn't really talked about. You know, travellers didn't understand why a child would go to preschool. They'd just maybe send them to primary. So they would, most of them now would attend preschool and primary. How we kind of got around that was the likes of traveller organisations. As community workers out in the community, working with families, doing family support work, working with individuals on a one-to-one -one basis, we would encourage them and show them the importance of building a child's social skills, mixing them with another child, you know, developing them, bringing them on and getting them prepared for secondary school. So the majority of travellers today send their children to preschool and they're also going to primary school. Um, in preschool and primary school, there's good enough feedback around it, but there's still a lot of negativity when it comes to primary schools, when it comes to discrimination. Like you'd have children today in primary school getting called a knacker by a settled child, somebody who comes from a settled Irish background or maybe someone that came into the country, didn't know anything about travellers, but settled Irish people educated them and said, well, they're different from us, they're not the same, and we call, they're known as a knacker in Irish society. Um, it's a derogatory term. Travellers do not like it. It's very hurtful and it's very offending. As most people, I think, would know, a knacker is a dead horse. It's not a human being, but it's a term that is highly associated with Irish travellers and that travellers would get called in schools in Ireland by other children. Uh, and I would have heard, I'd hear things like this maybe on a weekly, daily basis, where you'd be out in the community and a child would say, I don't want to go to school, maybe 11, 12 years old. And the parents had questioned and they'd say, well, I was in school yesterday and Tommy called me a dirty knacker. You know, he said, I'm not playing with him. He's a dirty knacker. My parents said, he's a knacker. Don't play with him in the schoolyard or mix with him. So this is still going on today and this is having a huge impact on traveller education because if you're in a school and you're getting singled out and picked out and calling derogatory terms or seeing that your father is a thief or your your father is robs or something like that, you know, they're hurtful things. And what child is going to want to get up and want to go to school if that's what you're going to face on a daily basis? They also face this in some instances from principals from teachers, from admin staff, from secretaries. It's kind of across the board. Travellers would be singled out, not added into certain WhatsApp groups, put into other WhatsApp groups that they felt were appropriate, maybe kept out from ones that was got to do with social events where people came together for celebrations and things like that. Travellers wouldn't be added into those WhatsApp groups. Um, so there's a bit of positivity around that when it comes to primary school. I find as a worker and as someone from the traveling community who has nieces and nephews and family members who are in the education system in Ireland at the minute, that when it comes to secondary school, traveler children are still being failed in the Irish education system. We still have travelers who attend school most of the time. Some of them still travel as a nomadic way of life during the summertime, but their children would attend school for the majority of the academic year. 
And we find that they're still coming out of school undiagnosed with dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, autism, for many reasons, waiting list, the cost of it, not being picked up, just maybe put to the back of the class. Um, a lot of people in the education systems bias maybe or mindset of travellers in the travelling community is that they don't value education they don't prioritize it and they don't want to go on maybe and do third level and eventually gain employment. So they kind of see it as a way that they'll marry young, they'll have a family and they'll go on social welfare, social welfare. And they themselves, some of them, not all of the people in the education system don't really prioritize those children then in class or kind of maybe if they show up, they show up. If they learn, they learn. They're probably put to the back of the class. You know, there's still stuff like this going on. So we still have young children coming out of primary school in 2023 from the traveling background. They can't read or write that have been on on a non diagnosis of maybe ADHD. This causes huge learning difficulties then for that child and for that family when they enter secondary school. The majority of them only stay in secondary school for a couple of weeks, a couple of months. After that, they go on a reduced timetable. They go in maybe a couple of hours a day. They go in maybe a couple of days a week. Eventually, they leave school altogether. Mm -hmm. And by the time a traveling boy or girl is 13, 14 years old, if you're lucky enough to have kept them in secondary school for that length, they're gone out of secondary school. They're gone out of system. Parents cannot get them back in. Um, us as workers, the homeschool liaison officer, we find it really, really hard to engage with them then and get them back into secondary school. One of it being that they're hugely discriminated against. And the other thing being that the young person is just not able to keep up with all the classes, the different teachers, the tests, the amount of work. Maybe they were on diagnosed in primary school and they have, as I said, they could have dyslexia, they could have ADHD, they could have autism. And they are not able to learn or keep up in the same way as another child in that class. So again, they're failed and they're left behind. <laughs> Um, then I'll, I'll maybe just talk really quickly about third level. So the majority of travellers do not go on. I think it's only 1% of travellers that go on in Ireland to do third level education. You know, it's not something that's really talked about within the community. Travellers feel that they don't belong in third level. They wouldn't be welcome. They wouldn't have a place there. And then there's a feeling within the community as well. So most of the community do now realize the importance, as I said at the beginning, that technology like is it's everything today. Everything you go about doing today, they'll say, go online for this, fill in this online. If you want to even bring kids to an entertainment job or offer today now, they'll say book it online. And that's for somebody who's educated, that's second nature. You probably won't give that a second thought. But for somebody who's not educated, and who has no IT skills, you know, that's a huge barrier and a huge problem in their life because they can't carry out those tasks. So travelers, travelers are now starting to see that the value in education, that tra travelers need to be educated, their young people need to be educated. For change to happen and in 10, 15 years time for travelers to be participating fully in the Irish education system, by attending preschool, primary school, secondary school, completing secondary school and doing their junior and leaving and going on to third level and eventually gaining employment, that those opportunities are available and there to travellers the same as they should be for every other Irish citizen. You know, it shouldn't only, it should be the same opportunity should be available for everybody. But for travellers in Ireland, the one opportunities, we don't have the same opportunities as everybody else. And it's a huge you know, literacy within the community, there's low, very low literacy levels within the community. Even people that have still now attended school and gone through some of the education system are still, you know, not able, coming out of school, not able to participate fully in society. Um, But I tell is there anything else that I'd like, maybe I haven't covered or I'll just maybe speak a little bit too about when I and other people that I know went back to maybe adult education, when I was thinking about going back to adult education, the limited time I did spend in the education system, like I do remember putting up your hand to use the bathroom and teacher, can I go to the bathroom and calling somebody teacher and miss and, 
And I felt a bit weary too when I'd be in a group, like I'd say, do I have to call this tutor, miss or teacher? And if I wanted to go out to use the bathroom or maybe I wanted to just go outside because I was finding it maybe a bit difficult in the class or, you know, I was not uncomfortable or felt uncomfortable in any way. You know, the tutors in the LOE to be would have always pointed out that this is an adult based service. We're an adult, you're an adult and we treat each other with mutual respect. And, you know, as an adult, if you want to go out and use the bathroom, you just get up and go. You don't have to raise your hand or, you know, say, miss, can I do this or that? So it it was not like being an adult brought back into a school setting and treated like a child. You were treated as a peer and equal as an adult. And I found when I went back to get education and sports with the LOE to be, I found that was a great relief to me, to be honest, because I would have had a bit of anxiety around that as well. And I would have thinking, oh, God. Am I going to go in here now and I'm going to be treated like a child or and maybe another bit of it as well. I would have thought that people would have looked at me and thought that I was stupid. You know, the how does this person and I, I never got that experience with the tutors in LOETB or, you know, I was always treated with respect and they were there to do a job and I was there as a student to learn. And that's kind of how the process worked. So I thought that was really a really good outcome and a really good benefit on their part that they were open and honest and treated people with that kind of respect and gave them that kind of support. Helene, that was so... Not I would say that I had a really, going back to education as an adult, even though I had so much fears around it in the beginning, I now realise today it was the best thing I ever done. And I'm glad I done it, that I didn't keep putting it off and putting it off and never engaged with the services and the supports that were out there. Because if that was the case, I would probably be, have a really, really difficult life today. So thank you. I hope I covered a lot of um things maybe that you were didn't know about, maybe you're unaware of. And you certainly did. That was absolutely wonderful. It was really honest and brave story. And I hope it, it it's inspired the people who are listening in. It's just it was lovely. Um could I just ask you before we go on to Derv and XP, could I ask you one question? Just um working with adult travelers now, what what could you give us one or two techniques or tips that you use to get them to come to, to your service, to access service or to go to, especially to education and literacy? What what works best, do you think? I think the most thing I think for workers is me- meeting the person where they're at. You know, meeting somebody, if somebody maybe did get a little bit of school in. You know, they have some bit of foundation that you can work with. If somebody never was in the education system at all, if somebody did go to the education system and they struggled in it for various reasons, maybe they were had something that was undiagnosed or they were unaware of their self and they just found it difficult and hard to learn. You know, I'd say always meet the individual or the person or the family or the community where they're at and kind of bring them along with you. You know, say, what do you think about maybe going to a preschool? If you don't think a preschool is for your child or your family or your community, why not come one morning with me? Let's visit a preschool, see how children interact, how they play, meet the teachers, meet the tutors, meet the SNAs, you know, stuff like that, because it's a little bit of fear of the unknown, you know, fear of the unknown, what we don't know for settled people, not all settled people, but for the majority of them and other Irish citizens. Things like this is normal. It's part of life and people don't really question why you just you would you would be looking out for registering your child for preschool, primary school and secondary school. But a traveler might see, well, geez, what's the point in sending a two or a three year old, you know, for a couple of hours a morning, five days a week? Sure, there'd probably be no point in it, Celine. But we would say this is the benefit of it. You know, you look at a child that's gone to preschool and compare it with a child that hasn't spent any time in the you're entitled to two years free preschool in Ireland so we would say like compare that child to maybe a ch- an older child you had that you didn't send and when you send that child into primary school and secondary school you will see the difference how it was easier maybe for that child to adapt and it could have been a bit more difficult for the child that didn't go so we don't we'd always like and we'd bring them into maybe coffee mornings we'd bring them into groups we'd work with them maybe through women's shed we have a couple of women's sheds where we would chat to them you know and give them like tips and things and explain to them the benefits of maybe sending their child to preschool and making sure that they know what's available and what's out there that there is 
two preschool year available to a child and that you know it's there and it should be taken up they should take up on those things you know maybe phone calls with them again work with them it could take weeks it could take months it could take years you know building their confidence and make, giving them information educating them knowledge making them aware of what's out there the supports is out there what's available maybe bringing them to meet a certain link person in an organization if it's an adult and you'd say well i met with the person in the LOE to be I found him a really nice person I could accompany you to that first meeting and then you could feel maybe more positive yourself and your confidence could build and say well I came here last week with Celine but you know I'm okay to go on next week myself or the week after and you've you've advocated on their behalf and you've supported them to make that first step which which is really hard like it is it's not easy when you're an adult going back to education because you're kind of basically starting from the beginning and it's not an easy journey and it takes a lot of commitment you know and a lot of prioritizing over other stuff and things like that there you know to go tonight you know you have to be committed to it as well and as I said to you when I first went to it I went left there leaving saying to myself I'm never going back in there again you know I'll never be sat in that class again but I realized that they it wasn't because the people did anything to me you know I realized I needed to go back there because it was for me, I was doing that for and for my life and my community and my family and not for anybody else. I mean, thanks a million. Um, you should read the comments in the chat. Thing. They're so positive about what you said. Um, inspirational is something that a few people wrote down about what you just said. So thanks so much. Um, we're, uh, we're going to go on to our next speaker, Derv, and hopefully we have time for questions at the end if anyone has questions for Celine or Derv. But um, thanks, Celine. And um, thanks so much. um so yeah, our next speaker is Derv Ryan. Derv uh, is uh, works with Nala, and she's going to chat about Nala's uh, literacy ambassador program in the prisons. So uh, over to you, Derv. Thanks, a million, Fergus, and uh, thanks, Celine. That that was brilliant. Um, I'm here scribbling down pages of notes. <laughs> just so many things you said there. Just brilliant ways of illustrating just how difficult it is for people. Um, so I'm just going to talk to you today about the piece of work that I've been doing with Nala um, over the past few months. And it's basically an outreach project. Um, my job in Nala is really around how do we let people know what's out there, what's available, like Celine said, what supports are there in the education and training boards, in the in-person at literacy classes. And then of course, with Nala, we would have um, tutors that can work with people over the phone if, if they're not able to travel to a center or they don't want to. And then, of course, we have our Learn with Nala online platform that some people also like to use and, again, can do that with support from tutors. So there's a lot of things that are out there, but people don't know. And then, of course, all of the barriers that Celine mentioned there, you know, the very, very, very poor experiences of school um, can be a big feature. And there's a lot of fear then uh, of what they'll meet if they went into an adult education setting um, and then of course all of the confidence self-esteem things people hiding for a long time so over the years in Ireland we're around a long time about 40 years we we have seen time and time again somebody with the experience of of having literacy needs as an adult is the best person to reach others you know that lived experience just works it's better than me doing it um, on my own because I haven't had that experience. So we work closely with current or former adult literacy students to, to spread the world. And this year we've been working on a literacy ambassador program in the prisons. Um, some of you might have worked in prisons yourself or might be aware of it. But just to give a bit of context. And um, there's two kind of figures that we have about literacy needs amongst people in prison. They're old and they're, you know, with statistics, they can also um, be underestimated because people have to participate in surveys. And if you have a literacy need, you might not be, that may not be something you would be engaged with. So the one study in the early 2000s said around 41% in prison would have left school um, at or before the age of 14. Um, and then we have the, the other figure there that 57% of people had an education at the junior cert level or below. And that was a 2019 figure. So, you know, 
we we knew that it was a problem both because of these pieces of research over the years but also from working with teachers so the teachers that work in prison education units they are employed by the education and training boards so we would have had connections with them uh fergus does a lot of professional develop events and conferences and they would have attended so we'd heard from them as well about the, the literacy issues in prisons um and in 2018 nala did a piece of work in port leash prison with the teachers there and students um it started off kind of as a workshop and awareness raising about literacy and working you know with the men to think figure out what is literacy how do we define it what does it look like what what are some of the things that you use literacy for in your day-to-day -day life and just having those conversations and that project actually evolved to seven men in the prison becoming volunteer adult literacy tutors themselves so doing um, a certificate um, and then going on to provide support to, to fellow prisoners. So as a result of that, we knew that it was an issue in prison that was appetite for it. And so we rolled out this ambassador program in 2023. And it's all kind of behind this. And some of you may have heard of the Adult Literacy for Life strategy. It might be new for some of you, but this is a government strategy launched in 21, 2021. Um, that really is saying we need an all government, all society strategy about literacy, like all the things Celine said, like there are a lot of people that are experiencing a lot of difficulties in life due to due to the literacy needs in loads of areas, whether it's their health and uh, dealing with bills and debt and finance, like it can have a massive impact. Um, and it was something that Nala had advocated for a very long time was to have an all government strategy that all departments become, you know, take take a focus on this and not just the Department of Education or further in higher education. So within that strategy, you can see there are 12 priority groups that were identified as ones that would have faced systemic inequalities, faced systemic uh, discrimination over the years or exclusion and, you know, need our support and at least be named so that funding and different things, approaches can, can focus on them. And so you can see there that um, incarcerated persons and ex-offenders are mentioned there and we would find you know within prisons when you do meet people there and you have you know you're having conversation with them you'll find that of course there's intersection across these priority groups you know people will be single parents they won't be members of the traveler community and um, they might be people that um are carers you know before they came into prison stuff so people have uh, lots of different experiences across the priority groups but I just wanted to, to show you that if, if you haven't come across that, and we can link you to the strategy if that's new for you. So like I said, the Literacy Ambassador Program this year grew from that 2018 project in Port Leash, and it was really developed in, in partnership with the students and the men in Port Leash and the teachers there. And that, to be honest, I think it has been the, the most important thing about its impact and success is it was built with the you know participation of people who we were going to run it with from the start they would tell us what worked what didn't work you know what they enjoyed what they didn't enjoy um and of course working within the prison context like the men are on the landings every day they know who's not going up to the education unit you know they might see who's struggling with different forms and things so they really were the experts in terms of how do we outreach within prisons and support more people um to take up learning as an adult um during the program we would go in with a long time nala ambassador that we would work with over the years and he was critical you know, we would not have gone into the prison and worked with people without someone with the lived experience. There just wouldn't be the same impact as all. Um, and and when Michael comes in and 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 works with us in the workshop, he, he shares his learning journey very much like Celine did for you there. And that just brings the level of judgment right down. People feel more comfortable because they see somebody in the room who's had it at literacy issues and is open about it and is not embarrassed and doesn't as much face that stigma anymore and that can be really inspiring for people and it helps people to just relax and open up a bit more so you know for us that's essential when when you're doing outreach with marginalized people is really bringing somebody um on your team who has that lived experience so so far we have um run the literacy ambassador program in eight prisons uh with around 60 participants so far um Ultimately, the goal of the program is to start conversations and um, it's to start conversations to reduce stigma and to reduce fear. 
And then if, you know, if people are ready or they're open to the information, it's about encouraging them to go to the education unit. And the, the education unit, sometimes you'll hear it being called school in the prison system. There's one in each of the prisons and there will be a variety of different classes going from literacy and numeracy to leave insert subjects, junior search subjects to practical things like woodwork, ceramics. It's different in each prison. Um, but, you know, for some people, like Celine mentioned, their experience at school is so poor, you know, crossing the threshold, it just wouldn't even occur to them. You know, education places were not places where they were safe. So it's it takes a long time, possibly, to encourage someone up. Um, and again, people who are already in prison who have a positive experience of education there are the best people to spread that message on the landing. Um, and they can tell us how how they might be able to do that or how we can support them to do it. Um, and sometimes it wasn't just about getting people to come up to the school or the education unit, but it was even spreading the word that there is a lot of people with adult literacy needs in Ireland. We, we estimate through research that was done that it's about 18 percent of the population would find it challenging to to read say the back of a paracetamol packet and be able to take the correct dosage like it is an extensive issue in the country and it's so important that we share that because people feel really alone like Celine said you know people are tied up and not thinking that they're the you know they're embarrassed they have carry a lot of shame and it can be really important to just say no it's actually a problem for everybody and it's not an individual problem it's a systemic issue caused by various problems in society and bringing that home is really important because people carry it around a lot that it's them and unfortunately whether it's from the system or from fellow students when they were younger they would have internalized messages about being stupid about not being able to learn you know that is really strongly told to us when we go into workshops you know that I was called stupid and I feel stupid and so you know it's all about working through that and trying to show people the reason there's anybody with adult literacy needs is they're all systemic reasons it's not someone's individual fault and so that's that's really an important part of the program um so the program itself is around four to six hours um done over two days or one day depends on the numbers we have and um, we try to make it literacy friendly so when we say to the teachers please invite you know 15 people to take part in this program we say nobody needs to have you know any literacy levels at all we'll do everything verbally or with support so nobody has to write in front of anybody nobody will be asked to read in front of anybody you know because again we find the people who are best going to outreach to others are those that are have gone through it or are currently in literacy classes um it's a developmental approach in the workshops meaning we have a lot of conversations, you know, we have our outline and our plan, but sometimes the conversations move in different ways, depending on the group and their experiences. And we let that happen and we move with that. Um, we, like I said, we go through, we tease out the definitions about literacy, the causes of adult literacy and issues in Ireland, the barriers. You can see there on the right, that's a, an iceberg kind of exercise we do. You'll see that it's across community development. We all love our iceberg exercises, um, but it's very much about the barriers uh, facing adults returning to learning and you'll see these are some examples actually from one of the workshop you know people talk a lot about stress and anxiety I can't tell you the amount of times anxiety came up and that was really interesting because even that language of mental health people really associate it with taking those steps and that nervousness about going into the, the education environment um like I said, the learner journey so that the, the long time now ambassador that has come in with us is crucial um just to 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 making people feel comfortable and just making sure that there is no judgment in the room you know um and it really puts people at ease and then at, towards the end it's all about discussing ideas and how they can share with others um about literacy just having conversations about it and possibly encouraging others to take up learning while they're in prison there's also the case of they're on the phone often to family and friends they get visits and there are people in their family who might have literacy needs that they might speak to. A lot of people in prison would have children and they are very dedicated to their children's learning and they want to know how can I encourage my child while I'm inside prison? Like people are doing homework with their children, you know, over the phone. So it's great for them to have that language um, around literacy. We also would tease out a lot about the wealth model. And in NALA, the wealth model is acknowledging regardless of your literacy skills, 
generally speaking as adults we all have strengths and experiences and skills we, we've lived a life we have that even if we're not confident in our literacy we might be brilliant with cars we might be excellent with woodwork we might be brilliant with children with older people so we really try to emphasize those skills and their importance um for you know for ambassadors to, when they're outreaching to reassure people like that's a really important skill set okay you might be a bit weaker on the literacy stuff but you offer so much and those conversations they can start to have those with their children as well so if their children is really good at child is really good at sport reassure them you know okay you might need a bit of support in the reading but you're brilliant at sports you know every one of us has different strengths so it's just these kind of conversations positive conversations about learning and how all our brains are different all our strengths are different and you can really see people's confidence over the few hours building as they start to open up a bit more and share in the groups um so part of, you know, this project, it's a pilot. So we're developing everything as we go. Do you know what I mean? Like we've started off with session plans and they've changed several times. Um, our handbook, I think we're on version four. Um, so these are just some of the different pieces we have developed in Alice so far. And like, it's it's still ongoing, to be honest, the project. We're hoping um, we'll have a report hopefully on it by the end of the year. Um, but this is just some of the things that have been developed. T-shirts were identified as something that would be really useful. So being visible as an ambassador. So if you're walking on the landings, having a T-shirt that relates to the school or education so someone knows, oh, I can go to, to John about learning. I can, I know he's doing that because he's wearing the T-shirt. Or just simply someone going, why are you wearing that T-shirt? What's that all about? It's just a conversation starter. Um, and it can work in the prison, but this could be applied in community settings as well. Like there is no restriction. It's just that we have ended up starting it in the prison, but it can be really applied to other places so again this is just an example of trying to be literacy friendly as we do our work in the workshops so this is the feedback form and this was the first version and um, we brought this into one place um, and then we got feedback about it and the feedback it was from a teacher who was very generous with her time and she said you know the white boxes is very overwhelming and you know we're now at national literacy agency and we were learning from that teacher saying, you know what, more tick boxes would be comfortable, particularly if there's literacy needs. I mean, it's obvious, you know, in some ways, but it's amazing just to be able to learn from the teachers and from their experience doing forms. So this is version one. And now I think we're on version five. So again, it's just about reducing down the number of questions for our feedback, having uh, symbols, you'll see there, the smiley faces, having tick boxes, and then leaving those those boxes for people's comments if they are comfortable and confident with this and it's also about making sure that there's a teacher in the room that can help people to do it if, if they're not comfortable or confident so just a small example of of how we've been um adapting as we go and how things are evolving just so we're a bit more literacy friendly um at the moment like we're just bringing together all the student feedback but we're getting generally positive feedback um Again, exactly what Celine said, people acknowledge the, the need for literacy in order to have a good quality of life. They acknowledge what they've missed out on or what people will miss out on. Um, it's good to see that at the end of the workshops, they might feel like there aren't as many barriers as they thought in terms of the type of opportunities available to people. And also that you're never too old. This is something that can you can hear a lot from adults at all, you know, at all ages over 30, like people say, ah, look, I've had, my time has passed. I'm here now. So I'll just, you know, I won't go back. That's a big one to overcome. And um, so it was good to hear a couple of people after the workshops be like, it's good to hear, you know, you're never too old and things like that. Um, some people as well, they 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 develop confidence by having the discussions just by being in a group and talking about things. That's something new to them. You know, one man spoke to me and he said, you know, we were, I mean, he was going up to the school for the first time and there was four people in his class and that was so overwhelming to him. Four people, we did not want to walk into that room, you know? So like Celine said, starting where people are at, like you would be amazed. And the type, you know, people who present maybe, you know, very confident in different ways or who you would see as being well able to move in the world, but to walk into a classroom with three other people, reduce them to nothing, you know what I mean? So it's just our assumptions about how people are in the world, but how they might be in an education setting. They can be really turned on its head. Um, so 
you know, I've kind of mentioned a few pieces there that we've learned about Anala about making things literacy friendly. We're just learning so much. And um, to be honest, we're definitely learning more than I think the participants in the workshops are learning from us. Um, the lived experience piece, essential. You could just see it happen. I know I keep saying it, but genuinely, when you're in a room with a group who may have had um, poor experiences in school or ed for education, when they hear that person talk about it up front and lay it out all on the table, first thing, it just brings people down. They feel like, okay, this is a space that I won't be judged or we can have these conversations. And of course, we would always say, you know, confidentiality is important and that we agree that as we as we talk. Um, stigma and embarrassment are huge. They're still some of the biggest barriers. And um, of course, for men, stigma can be really high as well, because this idea that having adult literacy needs is a weakness of some sort and to be vulnerable to talk about that. So that can be a huge barrier, particularly for men in prison. And um, all of the same things that Celine said, timing, you have to be in the right place. And sometimes, as mad as it might sound, ending up in prison and having a sentence ahead of you is the time, you know, and that can be the time where people take that opportunity. We, you know, we learned, we're just seeing how dedicated the teachers are and how important they are to the men. The men will always say when we ask about what's the benefits or what's different about learning as an adult, they will say the teachers are completely different. First name basis, really supportive, really reassuring, go at my own pace. Um, they'll try to teach me one way. If it doesn't work, they'll try another way. They won't give up. They'll keep going with me. And that that is really an integral part um, of returning to learning. Like Celine said, those first contacts you have when you go into the E2B, hugely important who you meet and how they, how they deal with you and talk to you. Um, in NALA, we're learning a lot about life in prison and how that impacts learning while they're there. Lots of all, all the internal systemic barriers. You know, prison is a very unique environment. And um, just small things like, you know, some people are getting their evening meal at four o'clock and then they're not eating their breakfast until eight. Do you know, things that we just didn't know about because we haven't had that experience. You're just learning all the time when you're in there about what life is like in prison. Um, and then, like, of course, learning about how do we work as an ally? How do we engage in prison? And everything we do is, is through the education units. And they have been incredibly supportive um, and really enthusiastic. And so we work with them to, to get in and to work with the group of men. They recruit people for our program. So we're continuously learning. Um, do keep an eye out. Oh, sorry, that's moving ahead. Do keep an eye out for the report that's coming, hopefully the end of December. I really have to do it, so it is coming. And, um, you know, there'll be lots of learning there and evaluation. Um, and, you know, an ambassador program is something that I do think people could to take. I'm sure some of you have already done this type of thing, your organization champions, spokespeople. Um, but I found what, what's really interesting is the workshop. There's something that's happening in the workshop that seems to be quite um a release for people in terms of the acknowledgement the school wasn't good for everybody. It doesn't always work for everybody. Everybody's brain's different. Everybody has different strengths. And that's okay. That's good. You know, you would be surprised how much baggage people are carrying um, in terms of unfortunate the messages they were told or the experiences they had. And just to be given a space to have a conversation about that and release some of that um, and then being able to use that to be able to talk to someone else. You know, it, it's it's a really interesting thing. So I'd leave it there, Fergus. Um, I can go through some of the other stuff when, when you're ready. Hey. Thanks a million. That was great. Um, really inspiring as well. It's a fantastic program. Uh, I liked on that last slide what you had about self-confidence and self-esteem. So often over the years, I've heard adult literacy learners and Celine was talking to us about it before we came on to talking to Derv and I that how important self-confidence and self-esteem was. And um so that was great. Thanks a million. Um so just what we're trying to get from this morning is that from what Selena said and what Derva said in your centre, can you take anything that they've talked about and use it for your centre to encourage adults to go back to literacy classes or to raise awareness about literacy? So maybe the service users who are using your centre, maybe they're struggling with literacy and you could make things a bit easier for them by adapting your website or your signage or the way you talk to people or deal with people or the type of emails you send out and just make it a bit simpler, a bit easier. And, and maybe you might encourage people to join your center, to access your services, 
and to return to learning and education. So there's a, a lot of comments came in saying, thanks so much, Derv and Celine, really inspiring. Um, I just picked out one or two comments uh, for you, Celine, a question uh, from Mary Stokes um, asking, did you, Celine, access the guidance counselling service through LETB or do you maybe encourage other adults to go and access the guidance? By the way, if anyone doesn't know, LOTB means uh, Leash and Offaly ETB. So ETB were what we used to be called 10 years ago, the VECs, now they're all called ETBs. So LO is Leash and Offaly. So Celine, did you access guidance counsellor or do, do you encourage others to, or do you hear much, is it good or bad or positive or helpful? Yes. Uh, so yes is the answer to that question. As Fergus just said, yeah, when I linked in with them, they were known as the VEC. They're now known as the LOE to be leashed off with me. But uh, at that time, I did. When I first started, um, when I first got the job, it was all new to me. Like, as I said, I had never been in an education system. I had never been in a job. You know, I was kind of thrown in at the deep end and it was sink or swim. And for everything I did, I always kind of came into it. And to be, if I'm being really, really honest, when I left the literacy or the job, I would have said, like, I'm not going back in there. It's too difficult. It's too hard. It's not for me. I don't fit in there. I don't belong to me. And even going back to maybe the age thing where Derville said about the age, like some people, like I would have been only in my 20s that time. I'm now in my 40s. And still today, like people say, well, why do you still link in with education today? You know, to think of you, you can, you're never too old to learn. I believe that we'll be learning from the day we're born till the day we die. You know, we can never have enough knowledge. We can never know enough stuff. And I have a passion for learning. You know, I love learning and I have a real passion for it. But when it was the VEC, I did link in with a guidance counsellor because, again, like it was all new to me. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know what I'd be good at. As Dervla said, you may not, some people may not be good with maths or they may not have the best handwriting in the world. But we all have different strengths and we're all good in different ways something I could be really good at another person could struggle with you know so everyone has their own different talents we're all unique and different in different ways and we all learn in different ways so I found the guidance counselor in the VEC at the time to be a great support to me I would recommend it to others and I have recommended it and do still do to this day and I would have also relinked in with a guidance counselor in the LOETB then her name is Catherine Gavigan and, you know, she would have said to me, well, Celine, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And I think that would be good for you. And then she would have said, well, this is the route you need to go for that. These are the courses you need to do if you want to go into childcare, if you want to be a youth worker, if you want to be a development worker, you know, if you want to go on and study, whatever. So I found having that support available in the LOE to be, to me, was a great support because it gave me... There was someone there that I could go in and talk to where I was probably sitting at home and Jesus, am I, I'm in doing a youth work job, but am I suited to being a youth worker? You know, is this for me? Am I good at it? Am I bad at it? Do I want to stay doing this for the rest of my life? You know, so she then helped me to see that I could branch out and go into healthcare. Then I could go on and maybe do education. You know, there was loads of different avenues that I could take. So that I found that been a great support and I still, I recommend it to others and still do to this day. So once again, thanks very much, Celine. Really appreciate that. Thanks very much, Derv great presentation thanks everyone for tuning in and hope to see you next friday and i'm gonna i'll send out everyone uh the information on the next three events coming up and we'll go, we've recorded this also so thanks everyone bye bye have a good weekend hope it doesn't thank, you. Rain too much. thank you thank you bye 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 thank you